Let's uh, get underway. Um, I am Ian Mulhern. I'm the uh, uh, head of the UK policy unit here at the Tony Blair Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our TBI Talks webinar uh, this morning on uh, social care funding and reform. Uh, this is our first event after the summer break, um, and if you hadn't clocked that the summer was over from all the high politics last week, then at least if you're in London, the weather has left us in no doubt this morning. Uh, that, that the summer is over. Uh, and last week, the government came forward with plans to reform uh, the funding of social care uh, and raise a huge slug of tax revenue, the new so-called health and social care levy, uh, which is set to raise uh, 14 billion pounds a year. Uh, and over the first three years, at least, most of that uh, funding is going to go into the NHS to help deal with the backlog caused by the pandemic. Uh, but then there is about 5.4 billion um, over three years uh, in there to fund a version of the Dilmot Commission's care costs cap uh, and a more generous uh, means test, uh, providing insurance so that people don't uh, fear losing everything when they start to need to pay for care. Uh, so today we're going to be discussing uh, what does all this uh, reform mean for social care? Will it fix the problem? Um, we'll be focusing on the funding side of it. Uh, is this the right way to do it? Are there better alternatives? And we'll also be getting into what is, where does this leave British politics and uh, the, the future of the 2020s in terms of the ta tax take and the size of the state. And to get into that, we're going to be uh, discussing it all with a first rate cross party panel. Uh, we will hear from Liz Kendall, uh, the Shadow Minister for Social Care and someone who has spent more time thinking about these questions than almost anybody in the Green Benches, uh, I think it's fair to say. Uh, we'll also hear from Ed Davey, the leader of the Liberal Democrats and also a uh, carer himself. Uh, and we'll hear from David Gork, a former uh, Treasury Minister who knows the Treasury inside out and also Cabinet Minister uh, in various roles in the Cameron and May uh, governments. And so we'll be looking to have a fairly free-flowing Q&A discussion under those kind of areas that I've outlined. If you have questions, please do put them in the Q&A box and I'll try to pick uh, some of them to feed into the discussion. Um, now, before we get into that discussion, um, ahead of last week's plan here at TBI, we published a report by my colleague James Brown, uh, in it, James set out the main uh, funding priorities that we see for social care uh, and also proposed a uh, set of uh, reform or uh, funding packages uh, to, to meet those needs. So to kick us off, I'm going to hand over to James, who'll give us a rundown on the headlines of the announcement from last week uh, and also how we think they measure up to what uh, needed to happen. So, James, if I, if I may, I'll hand over to you to, to share your screen and get us underway. Great. Um, so last week, um, our report uh, outlined the big problems that are currently facing the social care system in England. So over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of budget squeezes from central government, which has left uh, local authorities having to ration care, leading to significant unmet need among people who need care. It's estimated that there's about one and a half million people out there who aren't receiving the help they need with really just the very basic activities of daily living. And this has also caused problems in the sector. Care providers have stopped um, uh, providing their services to local authorities um, and uh, staff pay has fallen well behind levels in the NHS and indeed the private sector. And that's led to a lot of staff turnover and a lot of carers positions being unfilled. And this is on top of concerns that have existed for a long time about the harsh means test for social care, which forces people at the moment to use almost all their assets to pay for care before the government will give any help at all. Now, the announcement last week did uh, introduce, did uh, make some um, policy announcements that would seek to address that concern. Uh, so at the moment, uh, somebody who faces very high care costs over their lifetime, about £150,000, they don't receive any support uh, until they're down to their last 23000 The government's plan uh, said last week that uh, they'll introduce a cap of £86,000 on lifetime care costs uh, from October 2023. This means that the state will step in once assessed care costs, which, by the way, 
doesn't necessarily cover the entirety of someone's care costs, just those uh, that the local authority would itself pay for. Uh, but once you reach that level, the state will step in to pay those costs. And there's also going to be more means tested support uh, for those with less than £100,000 in assets to help them with co costs up to that £86,000 cap. Now, that's quite a lot less generous than the Dilnot Commission's proposals from 2011, uh, which would be a cap of about £46,000 in today's money. Uh, the government's plan still leaves those with assets of around £150,000 at risk uh, of having to use around half of that to pay for their care. And it's unclear that having such a high cap would realise uh, one of the key objectives from this proposal, uh, that it would encourage people to spend more out of their own resources for better quality care and spur innovation in the care sector. Uh, it's, it seems that there's not many people who'd feel confident that they'd be able to afford to pay more on an ongoing basis uh, on top of the £86,000 they're going to have to stump up uh, for the uh, assessed care costs up to the cap. Now, in our report, we ordered that a, we uh, suggested that a fairer approach would be a cap that was proportional to people's um, initial assets. So under that model, uh, the state would uh, step in um, once somebody had used 15% of their assets uh, to pay for care. Uh, that would provide better protection against these catastrophic care costs and give more people the confidence to pay more um, for better quality care, stimulating innov innovation uh, in the knowledge that the state would step in uh, once they had used only 15% of their assets. But there was little else in uh, last week's announcement for social care. Most of the money that's uh, raised by the tax measures I'll talk about in a minute uh, will go to the NHS for at least the, last, at least the next three years. And it's hard to see any government shifting the money from health to social care after that. As Ian said, only 5.4 billion uh, over the next three years uh, is going into social care and about half of that is going to pay for this cap and floor policy. There's little left uh, to shore up the existing system. Indeed, it may not even be enough uh, to match uh, growing demand for uh, social care from both an aging society and increased demand from working age adults. So really, we can anticipate that most aspects of the crisis in social care will just rumble on. Now, given this, we have to question whether it's uh, feasible to introduce a cap. At the moment, people who are self-funding their care cost subsidise those receiving support from the local authority. So bringing more, into, uh, in, more people into the state-funded system will only add to those problems. And we've got to, rem to remember that back in 2013, Jeremy Hunt, when he was uh, health secretary, out announced a similar uh, cap and floor policy, but it was never introduced because of uh, the problems that existed elsewhere in the system. And it seems quite possible that the same thing could happen again. Uh, to finish, I'll just say a little about uh, the tax side of the announcements uh, from last week. Uh, it's not quite a straight uh, increase in NICS as had previously been mooted, as this new health and social care levy it will also be paid by pensioners who are in paid work um, and the income tax rate on dividends will increase as well. Um, but it's still the case that income from rents, pensions, bank interests and capital gains will escape further taxation. And it still means that almost all of the costs of uh, paying for additional funds for health and social care uh, will fall on working age people. In our report last week, we looked at three alternative packages. Uh, the first one looked at how you could shift uh, more of the burden onto older people by increasing income tax for the over 40s and means testing winter fuel payments. The other two look at uh, increasing air, uh, taxes in areas that are currently undertaxed, whether that's, that's uh, property and capital gains. Increasing property taxes is an efficient way of uh, raising revenue. And there's little justification for the current uh, council tax system 
that taxes more expensive properties less heavily relative to their value. We estimate that an annual levy set at two thirds of 1% of property values would raise about the same as uh, the government's plans uh, and uh, capital gains uh, are taxed much less heavily than other forms of income, despite just uh, being another form of return to capital. And we propose various reforms in this area in the report, um, which would um, bring it more into line with uh, income tax and be a way of taxing uh, those who have benefited from uh, the recent boom in asset prices caused by falls in global interest rates. Uh, so I'll stop there and hand back to you, Ian. Somewhat bleak assessment uh, there about how uh, effective this package has been at solving the care crisis. But let's get straight into that. And Liz, maybe I can come to you first with that question. What's, what is your, your take on this package and the extent to which it uh, offers a solution to the long-standing problems of social care? Well, um, I mean, I think the two main tests are, will it work and is it fair? And I think the answer to, to both is no. Um, I personally think that we should be much more ambitious than just to tackle a crisis in, in social care. I think the big thing missing from this is reform, reform to, you know, enable older and disabled people and their family carers to live the life they choose. Um, and I don't want to see more money going into a system which isn't working for people, which doesn't give them greater control and say over the life they lead. So um, I think we should be much more ambitious. Uh, but the real issue is this does nothing for people in in the system right here, right now. I mean, the leaders of, of social services, ADAS said yesterday, you know, it's not going to provide an hour extra care and our extra better quality care, nothing for the paid workforce, nothing for unpaid family carers. And the massive issue is a third of the users and a half of the budget for social care goes on working age adults with disabilities. And for them, the issue is not, you know that they're having to sell their assets because they ha they haven't been building up that, those assets. So, uh, what I what I would say here is that um, the cap has kind of become this holy grail in in the policy world. But in fact, for it is one the issue of selling your homes to to pay for your care is an important, but no, by nowhere near. Uh, the means the important issue and I personally think that if the people who are actually using services and providing them kind of had more of a say here we'd realize that that's that's not the the solution but the big thing missing is nothing for social care now no guarantee it will get it in future and it's not about not about reform because social care isn't just about getting up, washed, dressed and fed, though that's important. It's about enabling older and disabled people to live a life like everybody else. This is not rocket science, but somehow we've ended up in, in a situ where, 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 situation where people think it's not possible to do that. That's wrong. And if we really listen to what people who use services say, we could find a way forward. So, Liz, in your main focus is what, what's the main priority that's not covered then? Is it unmet, the unmet need problem that you think is still out there? And then also I, I, quality, um, quality, quality training you yeah. know, for, for family carers who, let's be honest, do the vast bulk of caring in this country. Uh, absolutely zero. I mean, Ed will speak, you know, brilliantly about this from his, from his his own experiences. But it is also for working age adults with disabilities who, you know, want to be able to maybe work, get training, have a social life. Zero in this. So it's because we don't understand what social care really is, and then we don't have those reforms. And this is vital because if we don't help people stay living independently and well in their own homes for as long as possible, they will end up needing more expensive residential or hospital care. And that is poor, poor value for money for taxpayers. And that, that's my concern. 
All right, Ed, let's go, let's go to you and, and particularly I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on, I mean, as Liz said, the cap isn't everything, but it is uh, one part of the solution. I'd be interested in your take on whether or not this at least meets that part of the agenda. I was going to say I agree with everything that James said and everything that Liz said. Um, so you're going to have a consensual panel. Uh, <laughs> we'll see what David says at the moment. Um, I mean, partly for me, this is like Groundhog Day because... Um, I was in the cabinet when we agreed the reforms last time, which were built on the deal not. They were sort of similar amounts. We argued uh, between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats about uh, where the cap should be. You won't be surprised to know we, we were more at the deal not end, but we had to compromise and that's fine. Um, the frustration was when it wasn't implemented. And the frustration was that it wasn't implemented with the reforms because Liz is absolutely right you've got to have reforms. By the way, quite a lot of the reforms we need, not all of them, but quite a lot of them were in the Care Act 2014. Yeah. Um, give you an example, carer's needs assessment. Um, you are legally entitled, if you're a carer, to a needs assessment. You try and get one at your local authority. You try and get one. Do local authorities tell people they can get them? No, they don't. If you get a carer's needs assessment, and they're like gold dust, if you get one, um, it will then say, well, you're a carer, you've got these, these challenges, this is what support the local authority will give you. There's no money for the local authority to fund the carer's needs assessment to support the unpaid carer. So a lot of the thinking about the reforms that need to be done, it's in the law. It's just not funded. Um, equally, uh, personal budgets and giving carers and all people who, who need care more control over lives, which lives quite rightly talked about, that's in the law. It's just not implemented. I mean, it's it's tragic because a lot of thinking has been done in government, outside government, lots of consultations. It's been implemented. I, 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 I'm sorry to, to pay tribute to two particular people who happen to be in my party, but Paul Burstow and Norman Lamb worked for years on the reforms that went into the 2014 Care Act. And to see them unimplemented by failure to support local authorities to do them is an, an absolute tragedy. Now, yes, it's going to cost more money, and we can come to whenever we're going to talk about funding later on. But you know, the, the thinking and a lot of the work has been done there; it's just not been implemented. Uh, the other things I would say, which I particularly resonated me from from James's report, and and again, Liz touched on this, is the lack of care staff. I mean, they just aren't there. Was it one hundred twenty thousand vacancies prior to the pandemic? Um, and, you know, I'm not going to mention the B word. I don't think it will make it any better. Uh, if you talk to care home owners and providers, they are absolutely doing their nut. So I, I, a guy who I know in, in, who has a few care homes in the South, he was saying you know, he used to recruit in Romania, in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal. Can't do that now. Do you know where he's going? He's going to the Philippines. He's going to India. This is the reality. This is not the myth. This is happening now in care homes, care providers, because there are not enough staff. And there's no, I mean, maybe there will be in the white paper, who knows, but there ought to be it now because it's urgent. There needs to be a strategy to pay care workers better, to make it more professional, to put it on the same esteem and grading as NHS equivalent. Because the, the NHS takes staff from the care sector, by the way, that's sort of happening all the time. Um, oh, well, by the way, all, so does Amazon and so do supermarkets because care workers are paid so poorly. That's how we consider them. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of care workers in recent months. These are people who are looking after people who are often dying. And sometimes they're the only people these people who are dying see. They're the best friends of the people who are dying towards the last weeks of their lives. And when they're people who they're caring for, who, these people pay low, very low salaries, when they're, the people they're caring for die, they have to deal with that sadness and that bereavement of having got to know this elderly person who is now left or could be the elderly. And we, we treat them as if they're not really really worth any money. I mean, why would anyone work in the care sector with the way we treat them? 
we have to give them a career. And another point Liz made, which is absolutely on the money, which I feel quite passionately about, is, is the number of adults of working age who need support. If you talk to uh, adult social service directors in local authorities, this is the burning bridge. This is the financial, and it, it wasn't, you know, it's not mentioned by the government, it's like it doesn't exist. And I feel passionately about it because I'm an old dad, you know, I'm in my uh, mid fifties. I've got my wonderful boy who's 13, can't walk or can't talk. I care for him every day. Um, what happens when I'm dead? Who's gonna look after him? I, don't, I, see, I see no, as a father of someone who will be in this category, being 24 seven care, I don't see anything in this to help him and to help the many, many people like John. And so do I think this is, this is up to snuff? No, I do not. Do I think it's learned from all the work that's been done in the past? No, I do not. And, you know, the failure to deal with the, the, the crisis in care staff and the crisis facing the family carers, the millions out there, I think it's lamentable. All right, thanks, Ed. And um, uh, David, I mean, you know, you've heard from Liz and Ed there and, and James, a pretty sort of bleak assessment about the extent to which this is solving the problem. But of course, at the same time, the Conservative Party, which we can talk about a, a bit in, in a while, is, you know, uh, is, is wrestling with the, the, the cost of even this package. Um, do you think there's re uh, recognition or agreement of the idea that this, this hasn't really fixed it? Or do you think there is a view that, you know, this is all that really can, can be afforded? No, I think there is a, a recognition of, amongst a lot of people, um, clearly outside the Conservative Party, but I think also within the Conservative Party, that this hasn't fixed it for the reason that James uh, set out earlier, which is, you know, this money is going 12 billion pounds is a reasonably substantial amount of money, but it's not going into social care for the most part. And it's hard to see how in three years time, uh, you will see a shift away from uh, health care and the NHS and putting it into social care, which is you know, what the big promises suggest. Uh, and, and the idea, oh, this is just purely a kind of COVID catch up and then we'll all be fine. Um, I think is unlikely and and you know just on you know by the time we get to that point you know temporary increases of spending are hard to withdraw as the as, as the treasury are discovering with as, uh, with universal credit you know it's very hard to do that so uh, you know it, if we're in a position where the government is saying yeah we're going to going into the next general election yes we're about to cut health spending um that's not going to withstand scrutiny so that money is 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 either going to stay in healthcare, leaving the shortfall in social care or taxes are going to have to go up um so this doesn't fix it because because the numbers just aren't there and and, and i think it's a point that damien green for example has has made frequently and i think the concern amongst plenty particularly on the conservative right but not exclusively on the conservative right is look further taxes are going to have to go up um, you know, the revealed preference of this government is that they will increase the uh, uh, health and social care levy and it's, you know, it's been introduced now and it will be increased again in a few years time to put more money ostensibly into health care but really to fund uh, the promises that have been made in this package. Uh, and I think in terms of turning to the points that Liz and Ed have, have made, uh, no this is not the comprehensive uh, plan for social care. Uh, it is an attempt to have an announcement that says something on social care that the Prime Minister can say, look, I've, I've, I've got social care done. Um, but I think what has in truth happened here is that the, the Health Secretary has said, we need some more money for the healthcare uh, sector quickly, in part because of COVID, but in part because of all the pressures that are always there with healthcare. Um, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer has said, well, if we're going to spend more money, we're going to need to fund it and we're going to have to increase taxes. And the way that the pair of them have kind of delivered that is by saying to the Prime Minister, and of course, you can have your announcement on social care. Um, but but the, re the rhetoric and the reality are not aligned. Uh, and that does kick problems down the line. Um, as I say, the point that uh, Liz and Ed have made in terms of of, of delivery of social care how that is how that is done it's hard you know everyone talks about integration between health and uh, the NHS and, and local authorities that's difficult 
There's some evidence to suggest it's not you know, straightforward that the record in Manchester that was very much the sort of poster child of, of this, you know, it, it, it's, it's not that easy to just fix it. There isn't a, a magic formula uh, to this. I also think there's a, there's a missed opportunity and we'll get into the details of, of, of funding here. Um, but if you think that some of the, as I do, that some of the contribution has got to come from, uh, if, if we're looking at, at elderly social care, uh, some of that contribution has really got to come from the asset rich uh, elderly who are the beneficiaries of that social care and, and protecting inheritances should not be the number one priority by essentially saying this is a tax funded solution um bringing in taxes that that, that that don't collect at that end as it were and and then saying as you know the job is done here's the cap and we have funded it you miss an opportunity i think to 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 find a source of payment whether it's from tax or whether from an insurance premium <laughs> from those asset rich um, beneficiaries of, of, of social care. So in some respects, that makes it harder, I think, because you've closed off opportunity. It'd be much harder to come along and say, oh, you know, we said we'd have a cap. Well, you know, now you've got to pay a premium for that cap, or we're now we're going to put some tax, a tax on your home to pay for that cap. Too late, you've missed that opportunity. So, um, so yes, there is some extra money, but it's mostly not going into social care. Uh, and where it is going into social care, it's not really improving the quality of care, it's protecting inheritances to a large extent. Uh, and I think that leaves us uh, in, a, in a difficult position uh, and uh, you know, with problems two or three years down the line. So um, uh, thanks, David. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, as you kind of point out, the, the, the structural reform is real and everybody's agreed that there's more money is needed, but one of the looking on the bright side for a moment about this uh, announcement that there is a significant structural change here. There's a new liability for the government that's taking on a new role uh, with the cap set where it is. But I wondered if you could say a bit about uh, about the level of that cap. I mean, for, you talked about it as protecting inheritances, um, but I guess the other way of looking at it, and I think the way that uh, Andrew Dillnot's commission would have looked at it, is that you know if you set the cap too high then uh, most people don't feel very protected against uh, catastrophic loss and therefore they're not going to be looking to buy better quality care for their loved ones because they're worried they're not going to be able to afford it and therefore the care market still doesn't work because it's not it's, quality isn't driven money uh, isn't driven into the sector and you you end up in some ways risking falling between two stools you spend a couple of billion quid a year on protecting inheritances but you don't actually improve the quality of of care is that is is it would you know so you can sort of see two arguments one is that you you don't need this cap at all or the other is that it should be much lower but the 86 is just uh, neither here nor there um what's your sort of thoughts on on that yeah I, I think that's that's potentially a fair point but you can see what the you know the challenge is and and if you are the the treasury worried about how expensive this is and and whether directing money towards the cap um, is the right priority, then you can see why you you, you move the cap higher uh, than than Dill not recommended. Um, you're right to say the problem the problem is that it then looks as if the main beneficiaries are going to be those with with larger states or about to inherit larger states, uh, and and that I think is hard to justify, and, and that that's why personally I'm 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 skeptical about. Uh, a, a, about the cap and whether that should be the priority. I think clearly social care needs more money, but there are plenty of things that we can spend the money on, you know, delivering the reform that, that Liz and Ed have been talking about that would be beneficial and improve the quality of, of, of care. And, and, and then I think we can find other ways and uh, say I'm, I'm I'm quite attracted to the uh, to the Lilly proposal in terms of an insurance premium, a voluntary insurance premium that people can uh, a, a acquire. That has there are some real political difficulties for a, for a government in implementing that. But I think that is a means of extracting sums of money out of the the asset rich uh, in a way that um, could be essentially self financing. That means that the scarce resources that we have can be directed at, at yes increasing the floor 
uh, being tested floor and 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 yes, addressing some of the the, the structural challenges that we've we've been hearing about this morning. Okay, great. Let's move on to the the funding side, which we've touched on a bit already. Um, now we all sort of seem to be agreed that there's probably this probably isn't the last. Uh, that we've heard of, of, of uh, the need for more funding here, um, but it's still an awful lot and it's a big next rise. Um, so uh, I guess the question probably starting with you, Liz, is, you know, what, what are the alternatives? Um, uh, you know, this is obviously a similar approach to the one Gordon Brown took in 2002. Um, you know, are there, is it really the, uh, uh, not a good way to fund this? Uh, what will be the alternatives? Uh, in your view, I think just to to start with that point about look when when Labour did this in two thousand and two, I mean it was off the back of a decade of rises in wages, and it was um, specifically for the NHS. And I would also argue we had a plan. You know, we had the one list review about reform and the ten year NHS plan. And I have, being a moderniser. I believe in investment and reform, that the two go hand in hand together, they have to. Um, and the big challenge for any government is as we're all living for longer, brilliantly, that we all need healthier lives for longer in all parts of the country. And the big reforms you need you know, to shift the focus to prevention, tackle, tackle the root causes of ill health, we never, we never ever talk about because it's too difficult, but that, that's where we need to be. Um, you know, I, I have always believed that we are, you know, in my party, we are labour. We should do what we say on the tin and reward work. And I think the change in the shape of the economy over the last 20 years, with the huge gains people have seen on their financial assets, primarily through low interest rates and, and quantitative easing, you know, rather than necessarily through any um, uh, effort or merit of their own. I mean, I think we need to tax that unearned income more fairly. Uh, I think the big challenge for any government is whether if we find a way of doing that more, more fairly so that we are we are not seeing work penalised um, is where that money goes. And of course, I want to see a properly funded social care system. But, you know, Labour is about delivering opportunity and security for all. And, you know, we, we want to make sure that there is money for our other priorities. I've always been a big champion of the early years. If you invest in the early years, that is the best thing to improve health for children, transform opportunity, childcare and social care, you know, a modernised welfare state. Both of those things were excluded when the welfare state was created because women stayed at home and looked after the kids and the average life expectancy was 63. It's completely different now. So, you know, that would be my vision of a modernized welfare state in its broadest sense to deliver opportunity and security. And that we need to look um, at making sure wealthier people, including wealthier pensioners, I agree with David, and unearned income is taxed more fairly to achieve that goal. But on both of those things, it's got to come with the reform. Invest upfront, early inter intervention and prevention, whether that's for children or older people, doesn't necessarily release savings but it does mean you get better value for taxpayers' money, and it's better for individuals. So that would be that would be my approach. David, the point Liz raises about the backdrop to this tax rise on pay packets is is pretty stark, isn't it? I mean, this is a, a year when we've seen a trillion pounds pretty much added to the value of UK housing, um, and against that backdrop, I mean, we all understand the difficulty of the politics here, but. Um, isn't there a risk in this uh, for, for the Conservatives that, that, that this just feels like the wrong thing to be doing at a time when people with assets have, have just seen huge uh, unknown gains? Yeah, there's certainly certainly a risk. Look, uh, to, to put myself um, put myself back in the sort of position if I was um, trying to defend the government, I'd, I'd, I'd make the point that look, if we want substantial sums of money. We have got three big taxes that raise two thirds of all government revenue, which is income tax, national insurance contributions and VAT. Um, had VAT gone up, then the, the, 
the complaints about the regressive nature of it uh, would be all the stronger. Um, income tax, which is clearly a better tax on income than national insurance contributions, um, is is probably what they should have done. But it's so totemic, you know, nobody has increased the rate of the basic rate of income tax uh, since 1975, uh, when it went up from 33% to 35%. It's just come down all the way since then. Um, and and uh, look, national insurance contributions aren't what a lot of the public think they are. It's not hypothecated. It's not really contributory. It's just another tax on income with some weird uh, tweaks to its base uh, that makes it distortive. Uh, but the public are prepared to live with national insurance contributions and the way they're not prepared to live with income tax. So if you're looking to raise serious sums of revenue, then you, you use those taxes. And yeah, the point on sort of unearned income and so on. I mean, let me let me put forward two tax reforms uh, that would uh, that would raise money from this source. Now, you could increase inheritance tax, or you could put capital gains tax on the primary residence. Um, but you know, I, I, I I'll, I'll look to to Ed and Kit uh, and Liz to uh, sort of jump up and down and say, yeah, that's that's exactly what we should do. Um, it's that's electorally enormously difficult, and, and let alone the Conservative Party uh, going anywhere near that. Nor, nor am I particularly uh, necessarily advocating it myself. Um, but yeah, that just shows how difficult it is if you want to sort of use the tax system to tap into those areas. Now, of course, there are other things that could be done, and you know, James mentioned earlier reform of council tax and so on. Uh, which would be very, very sensible, but they're not going to be huge revenue raisers. Uh, and, you know, dry taxes in particular are hard to get very much revenue from. So uh, I don't particularly like the, the approach the government has taken in terms of the revenue raising. I, I think, you know, the, the, there are real problems with national insurance and uh, the lack of transparency and, and public understanding of it worries me. And eventually I think that will break. Uh, and, and the government in place when that happens will have real problems. But um, you know, to be fair to the government, if you want to raise serious sums of money, you're going to have to use one of the big big three taxes, and that is what they've done. And on on the uh, the the Nix uh, thing, as several of you have said, you know, obviously has this kind of PR advantage in that people have a view on what it is and and uh, and are perhaps more prepared to to pay it. Um, do you think that? strategy is running out of road. I mean, as you've highlighted, income tax has not gone anywhere for, for years. The take has uh, been shifted slowly onto NICS. It's becoming more salient in the public's minds. And, and I'm sure this whole debate will start to shift perceptions of NICS. Do you think that it, it is a sustainable vehicle for, I mean, quite apart from the economics of whether it's a good idea, is it a sustainable vehicle for raising the funding for social care in the years ahead, do you think? Well, I, I, my guess is they'll... they'll sorry, is that to me or...? Uh, sorry, to David, that one. Sorry, I, I, sorry just, just to say, I think, I, mean, I think they'll probably now... You know, we've now got a third tax on income, so you know, it's NICS initially, but then it becomes the, the health and social care levy, which is a bit broader, um, and, and they'll, they'll, go in that, they'll go in that direction. I mean, the, the thing that worries Treasury officials most, I think, is, is structural. This is, again, a difficult political one, but structurally, you know, we are so favouring self-employment over in, in, you know, PAYE employees mm. who are hit twice, once by employees NICs and, and secondly by employers NICs, where they in truth bear the burden. The, the, and, and, and that gap between employed and self-employed has just got wider as a consequence of last week's announcement. And, you know, unless you address that, yeah. you're going to start seeing sort of structural pressures, more and more people moving into self-employment, even if it's somewhat you know, false self-employment, and that will create a strain on the exchequer and, um, you know, real problems down the line. So there's a, I think there's a structural strate strategy issue uh, that the government, at least the Treasury, is well aware of. And Ed, I mean, keen to hear your take on the funding options, but also one of the questions that's come in in the Q&A there is about um, the, 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 the potential for reaching cross-party consensus on this issue, which has been so uh, um, uh, fraught for 20 plus years. 
is is that just completely naive do you think or do you think there would have been or in the future there may be the basis for some kind of consensus about how we fund this well, i think first thing that we haven't been able to be cross-party on this i think the public feel pretty let down by it i mean the one of the promises that the prime minister made when he, two years ago he said he got a not an oven ready deal in this case but he got a package ready on the when he moved into downing street um was he also said it'd be cross-party they wrote to us at one stage and said you know we were going to want your ideas want to bring you in and i wrote to, to the prime minister three times and said we're ready for the cross-party talks when this starting ne never happened the only thing we ever had a approaching uh, cross-party was of course the coalition where we, there was a deal and by the way the payment of that deal was re mainly through inheritance tax uh to take up david's point um but then they the then Cameron's government welched on that deal. So the experience of cross party working on this is depressing, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of uh national insurance, I agree with what David said. I mean, um essentially the, the real danger is it's a it's a tax on on jobs, it's a tax on businesses. And um people the, the, the politicians and in, in, in this time. Boris Johnson seems to think that he can get away with that. But A, that has the point that David made, uh, that it increases the incentive to self-employment uh, so people escape that. But it also um, is bad for jobs. I mean, I think it was uh, McPherson in the FT, or the FT or today, um, saying that this is a, uh, we're seeing taxes on businesses, on, on people employing uh, uh, people, um, ratchet up. So that's clearly a very bad approach. So I think the national insurance is completely wrong. Um, of the proposals that James made, um, I think uh, the income tax is the one that we had on our last manifesto, and we can argue about that's the right one, but that's the way we were going to do it. Um, I think you know, reform of, of council tax is fraught with uh, uh, political uh, challenges, but it's certainly long overdue. Uh, whether you would tie it to this is a, is a separate question. Um, I think capital gains tax is definitely an area to look at in a way, not necessarily David's proposal, but you know, for example, you get um, a, an allowance against capital gains tax, a generous allowance, and you know, a generous allowance against income tax. Well, the people who can use both tend to be, almost by definition, very wealthy. Why do they get two tax allowances? That really doesn't make sense. Mm. So there's, there's, there's definitely room for... Um, a much fairer approach to funding social care. Um, can I just comment briefly, though, because it's very much related on the cap proposal yeah. that James put forward, this, this proportional cap. Uh, I'd never seen that before. I think it's really interesting. And um, congratulations for putting it out there. I think that should be part of this debate. I, I haven't thought about it in any detail. But if we're taking the point that I think both Liz and David made, that you know, there's a lot of um, assets that have grown in value for the wealthiest in our society. Who will be the main beneficiaries from the cap, right? The, the main beneficiaries from the cap are the wealthiest with the most value, valuable properties. So it's not unreasonable to suggest that the payment of this should at least reflect some of that. And that was the beauty of what you were put forward. I haven't seen any analysis of it, James, but I think it does take us... In that direction and so the cap is part of how you pay for it right because that both determines what you have to pay for and who bears that uh, uh burden so i think in in the in the paying for it debate we have to look at the cap structure Great, thank you, Ed. Okay, there are a lot of good questions about details of the care system which are pretty critical. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to get into that detail. And I want to just save the last 10 minutes um, to focus a bit more on the politics of this, given the, the speakers we've got um, who are brilliantly placed to, to focus on that. So um, I will, I will uh, really focus on some of the questions that have come in around that. Um, and so starting, I mean, Ed, starting with you again, I guess, um, if we will come to what this means for the Conservative Party and the arguments that are going on there, and David's written a piece yesterday which uh, sets some of that out really well, um, 
but clearly for the other parties for, and, and for Labour and the Lib Dems, there's a question of where the space is now in this debate with uh, the Conservatives showing the willingness to, you know, this year they've raised more tax money as a proportion of GDP, I think, than, than any kind of modern uh, uh, budget or, or year on record. So wh where does that leave the space for uh, the Liberal Democrats uh, on the sort of size of the state and the taxation debate? Well, I mean, can I just look at it uh, from an electoral point of view, uh, because it creates even more space for us. Um, you might remember my corny photo up after the Cheshire Amersham by-election victory with uh, an orange mallet and a blue wall. Uh, and um, there was a lot of unhappy Tory voters uh, out there in those types of seats. And the Conservatives have played on the fact for years, or the their their claim for years that they're the low tax party. It's going to be interesting them making that claim at the next election. And there will have been voters who would previously have voted Conservative because of that reason. And it's going to ring a bit hollow <laughs> uh, if they go into the next election saying they're the tax cutting party or the low tax party. And that creates space for, uh, certainly for the Liberal Democrats, uh, Liz will argue for Labour, because that weapon that the Conservative use is just not credible anymore. And therefore, people who want to vote for parties that you know, believe in business, small business, believe in dealing with the caring issue properly, believe in investing in education, you have a progressive agenda, whether it's on the environment or elsewhere, might think, you know, actually what? Um, I don't believe these Conservatives anymore. Um, I, I'll actually vote with my heart as well as my head. Um, and I'll vote. A Liberal Democrat in our case. So um, I think it creates a massive opportunity for us um, because the Conservatives simply can't criticise us any longer in the way they, they used to. Um, I mean, there's a, don't get me wrong, there's a long way between now and the next election uh, and a lot of work to be done, but uh, the Conservatives have given up effectively their trump card. And in, in, in light of the discussion we've just had, though, clearly there's a lot more to be done here. And um, it seems uh, unlikely that, that, that all the problems are solved. Um, so can, can you really say that if you know, the Lib Dems are in government, that this would be the, the last significant increase in taxes in the 2020s? Do you think that's, that's plausible? I think there's room for tax reform. I mean, the fact that we're saying that the way the Conservatives have chosen to tax is an unfair tax, an unfair way, suggests that we might want to create a fairer tax system. We might want to create a simpler tax system. And one of the, the things that I hear from business all the time is the tax system is becoming horrendously complicated. So whether it's fairer taxes, whether it's simpler taxes, whether it's greener taxes, you know, there are principles one can apply to the existing tax system and say, well, you know, taxes don't have to be raised in the way they are. We could raise the same amount of money, but we could do it more fairly. We could do it in a way which actually uh, promotes our uh, agenda, whether it's the green agenda, but also reduces the cost of, of bringing in that taxes, those taxes. Um, and, you know, would I, do I think there are some large companies out there who aren't paying their fair share of tax? Well, I do actually. Do I think there are people who are getting away with blue murder through tax uh, avoidance? Legitimate, but I don't think it's right. Yes, I do. Mm. Um, and um, I think there's a lot of tax loopholes which have not been uh, closed down or indeed have been opened up. I mean, I think this one, is, uh, in the way that David said, this opens up or extends an existing tax loophole. So there's a lot of de debate, and I think there can be some reasonable people from the Conservative Party who would accept this tax system isn't fair, it isn't promoting objectives like, like the environment, uh, and it's way too complicated and, and expensive to administer. So there'll be a debate on tax, but whether or not there's a, a debate on, you know, it needs to go up by another 2% of GDP, I mean, maybe there will be that, but um, I, I'm not sure if that's where the debate is at the moment. Okay, thanks, Ed. Liz, on uh, sort of the same question to you, really, about where does this leave Labour, but, you know, and, but not just on the tax side, but also on the party of the NHS front, where clearly uh, 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 Johnson's aim is to park his tanks on, on Labour turf. Yeah. So what, what's, your, what's your response? Where's the space here? 
I mean, Labour wins when we have a broad coalition from our so-called more traditional working class uh, constituencies and more middle class ones. I mean, David knows this. Uh, I, I grew up in Watford, my family in Chesham and Amersham, but I re represent a more traditional street. A, a, a constituency you know we need to win um in, in Watford and Mansfield so number one we have to find uh something that works for everybody and as I've said opportunity and security is what people want and sometimes I think we overcomplicate politics most people want a good job that pays a decent wage a home they can call their own you know security if things go wrong and hope that they can build a better future for their kids and social care is part of that but there's a much bigger agenda secondly labour wins if we are trusted with people's taxes and with their money that is why the reform message is so important because what we're going to end up here with the Tories is a tax rise on ordinary working people right through the NI they'll face another tax rise through council tax which we haven't even asked because that's what council is going to have to do to put into social care and they're not going to see any improvements uh, in quality I think that is a massive uh, own goal but crucially the third point labour wins when we are about the future and we live in the century of ageing and we need to see from what President Biden is doing, investing in social care, not just because it's good for the people who use it, because he understands in the century of ageing, social care is as much a part of our modern infrastructure as the roads and the railways. And that I think is a vision. It's a winning vision in every part of the country. And uh, I'm afraid the Conservatives have, uh, uh, since the likes of David have gone, uh, vacated that territory. Okay, yeah, that's a good point to go to David. David, um, for you, I mean, you you would have seen, no doubt, lots of discussion, and 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 um, uh, you've uh, written about it as well uh, of how sustainable the new uh, nearly forty percent of GDP uh, tax take uh, that we're sort of heading towards is uh, for the UK economy. So, my first question to you is: is is do you think it is a sustainable level of of tax revenue for for the UK economy? Perhaps, but it's really difficult. Um, you know, it's higher than 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 we have had historically. I, I think to use Liz's phrase, you know, the aging century is is is, is right, and that does create its own pressures. Uh, demography drives up health spending. Expectations as we become richer drives up health spending. Uh, you know, for years we were able to, as a country, shift resources from defence into health. But you know, it's, as, as you well know, Ian, it's really striking the degree in which health spending has become a larger and larger part of our uh, economy. Uh, and it's hard to see how that will stop happening for, for some time yet. Uh, and that means, given that we have a, a, a tax-funded health system, and there's no prospect of that, that changing fundamentally uh, anytime soon, uh, that means taxes are going to have to go up. And it's a really hard thing for a lot of my former colleagues to swallow. And the reaction to uh, last week's announcement demonstrates that. But but that is what is, 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 is going to happen. Then the debate, I think, does move on to some of the questions that Ed was talking about. You know, how do you raise taxes? And some of the things that Liz has been talking about is how do you spend money? One thing I would say uh, in terms of, you know, is this a disaster for the Conservative Party? Um, in putting up taxes, and yes, they can't say you know we're the tax cutters, but you know very often that's not the primary argument the Conservatives make. Uh, Conservatives make the argument that we're good custodians of the economy, we look after the public finances, and yes, taxes will be lower than they would be under Labour, but you know lots of Conservative governments, including the one in which I served, put up taxes. Uh, so I don't think it is as simple to say that you know, the Conservative Party is a, is a low tax party or is nothing. Partly it's relative and in an environment where spending is going to go up, um, then the, what the Conservatives I think need to do, and I'm not sure they are doing at the moment, is to start thinking long and hard about how you raise the money and how you spend the money. Uh, and, and there I think there is plenty of grounds for criticism. OK, great. And, and then, David, I've got to ask you this to finish, really. Um, it, it seems kind of as your as your piece in Conservative Homes sort of outlines that, 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 that uh, the government has gone for the electoral centre ground at the expense of internal party 
cohesion and uh, and calm. Uh, and so, I mean, can a big taxing Conservative Chancellor really hope to win uh, a Conservative leadership contest? Uh, I, I think uh, a, a nimble, politically adroit Chancellor can do. Uh, and I think we have got a fairly nimble and adroit uh, political Chancellor. So, so I think the answer to that is yes. Great, very efficiently answered. Listen, we are um, pretty much uh, out of time, so I'll, I'll draw us uh, to a close. I mean, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, there's, uh, I think, a pretty clear consensus that 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 all three of you um, recognise that we're we're not really done with uh, solving the social care crisis uh, by a long chalk uh, yet. Um, and that whatever you think about the, the way this tax rise has been done, it seems likely there's probably going to be more to come in the uh, later in the 2020s. So we, we face some, some difficult years, I think, where this, these uh, questions uh, will uh, become uh, the, the centre center of debate in, in British politics. So it's going to be fascinating to watch how it all uh, unfolds. Um, that's it from us. So all that remains for me to do is to say uh, thank you to David, to Liz and to Ed uh, for their contributions and to James indeed. Uh, and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks for joining us.